Well, good morning, explorers. How are you today? That's great. We're going to be doing our ABCs under the sea. Well, I'm not actually under the ocean. It's okay. I don't have to hold my breath. That'd be a weird class if I did. So we are going to explore lots of lovely animals. But let's practice making observations like scientists because we're all scientists today and we should make some observations together. What did you notice? Hmm. Do you recognize this exhibit? If you've been watching our classes, I bet you do. This is our shark lagoon habitat. Did you find all the sharks? <gasps> there's one. And there's one. What else do you notice in here? There are a lot of fish. And what are, he hello shark. That's one of our zebra sharks. The camera inside the exhibit is actually in a spot where sometimes the animals bump into it. So sometimes they rearrange the camera and that's okay. We let them do it. Okay. We're not just going to explore and look for things, but we're going to practice our alphabet with the animals. Are you ready to practice the alphabet with me today? Great. Well, if you have questions or things you want to share with us, you can text us live at 562-286-1838. And my friend Emily is over at the question line. They'll be able to help answer your questions or put some of them into the studio so we can answer them for you live on the air. If you're not watching live on Monday morning, you can still ask us questions. Our email down here, live at lbaop.org, is another way that you can interact with us. So if you're going to text in, you're one of our younger viewers, make sure you have permission to use that texting device because text rates do apply. Okay, I need my alphabet tools. Ta-da! We gotta fill it in though. There's no alphabet on here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a few different animals. Now normally our ABCs under the C class just kinda goes in order, but I said we'd be a little crazy today and have some fun and jump all over the alphabet. Are you ready? Okay, we're going to start near the beginning because, you know, it's fun. With a very cute little animal that lives at the very bottom of the ocean and starts with this letter. The letter B makes a B sound like buzz, buzzing bees. What animal could live at the bottom of the ocean that starts with the letter B? Hmm. Allie. Who lives down there? Oh, she said she she has to take a minute to find the animal. All right, we are going to talk about it. But while Allie finds a picture of them, let's see if we can finish spelling out their name. Bobtail squid. Now I'm left-handed and I don't write especially pretty like Allie or Emily do, but that's okay. It's my writing, too bad. So, bobtail squid look like this. Is that exactly like a squid that you remember? Mm, not exactly. The squid I remember thinking about kind of look like this. The big eye and arms and tentacles. That's more what I was thinking. Yeah, that's What's wrong with the bobtail squid? Oh, okay. So nothing's really wrong with the bobtail squid. What they do is they scrunch up into a little tiny ball at the bottom of the ocean so that they can hide. Other squid don't really scrunch up very much, but this one, it can. Now, most squid have a really hard part in their back called a pen. It's kind of like piece of plastic it actually looks like plastic but it's something that they grow it helps give them their long cylinder shape but if you're a bobtail squid and you need to scrunch up maybe that pen is not as rigid or not as long so that you can turn yourself from a long skinny animal into a little ball now Caleb's asking what does a bobtail squid eat very good question because if it lives down at the bottom of the ocean like this 
What is down here to eat? Hmm. Well, a lot of animals in the bottom of the ocean are going to be just like the animals at the top of the ocean. Lots of carnivores and some herbivores. Do you know what those words mean? Well, carnivores eat other animals. They eat meat. Herbivores only eat plants or algae. There's not a lot of plants down at the bottom of the ocean. Actually, probably zero plants. Because plants and algae need sunlight to grow. Way down here, there is no sunlight. So, probably no herbivores. Unless they go way up to the part where the sunlight can reach and try to eat stuff up there. But otherwise, this animal is going to be eating other things. Things like crabs, maybe snails, maybe other fish. So squid have a really powerful mouth called a beak, and they can chew open things with shells. Other kinds of animals pry open the shell to get to the food inside, but a squid and an octopus, their cousins, have a really powerful mouth to break it open. So here is an example of what could be food for a squid on the bottom of the ocean. This really pretty crab has to protect itself so it doesn't turn into food. So all these animals have adaptations, abilities to survive that help them either find food or prevent from being food. But they can't be 100% successful because then nobody would eat anything. So that's okay. What does this animal have to try and eat with? They've got these really big claws and they have special mouth parts that can tear apart their food. So we use tools to cut apart our food. But they, you can actually see those little mouth parts moving around. <laughs> they have really powerful jaws to help tear up their food so they can chew on it. Their mouth is actually very, very small. I'd be much more concerned about getting pinched by a crab than uh, being chewed on by a crab. But I'm not really worried about either one because I don't really hang out with crabs too much. Okay. So the bobtail squid, now normally you won't see it doing this all the time, but if it's trying to not be seen, it'll hang out and hold still. When the deep sea uh, research vessel the, which one? This was Hercules that found this one. When Hercules was able to find this squid, it was swimming around, and then suddenly it realized, oh no, I'm on camera, and I don't want to be on camera. And so it sat down on the bottom of the ocean and tried to be as small and invisible, invisible as possible. So the bobtail squid does swim around and look like squid a lot of the time, but if it's trying to hide, it's going to turn itself into a little ball. Now, if you want to watch more about the bobtail squid, the researchers on the EV Nautilus, the research vessel that found the bobtail squid with their remote submarines called Hercules and... I just forgot the name of the other one. What's, what's the other one besides Hercules? We all just had a blank moment where we can't remember the name of the other one. That's okay. So they have two, and Hercules was the one that found this one. Now, scientists don't always know what some of these things are. So if they think they found a new animal, they have to try and take pictures, maybe collect one, and see if they can figure out who it is or who it's most related to. But a lot of things, they start to recognize what it could be similar to. So at least, as long as they're still getting video capture of it, like the pictures and videos that they, they record while they're down there, they can start to learn more about these animals and name more unknown things. So these scientists are discovering new things all the time whenever they get to visit these deep, deep, deep ocean sections where the bobtail squid lives. Oh, yes. Ar so it's Hercules and Argus. Hercules is the one with the big robot arms that does all the things. Argus kind of watches over Hercules so that if anything happens, Argus can take over. But also so they can get extra video footage of what's going on. It's a pretty neat setup. So... Oh, this one came from the Okeanos. That's not the uh, Nautilus, but the Okeanos is also a research vessel from NOAA. And they, too, have a lot of videos that they can show off. The Okeanos has a different web page. So if you look them up on the Internet, you can look for the Nautilus and the Okeanos and learn a whole lot more about deep ocean animals. Kind of like the next animal I want to show you. This one is a really fun animal with lots and lots of legs. 
And a lot of people around here think they look kind of goofy. I think they're really cool because they're like my favorite land animal when I was a kid, the roly-poly. Did you know there's roly-polies in the ocean? There really are. Our next animal is going to start with the letter I. Maybe I need a thicker marker. Or I can make the letter that much thicker. The letter I. This animal is called an isopod. That's a very fun word to say, isopod. Let's take a look at them real quick. Ooh, they're so cute. I love isopods. A lot of people think they're kind of creepy. I think they're really fun. Now, roly polies and isopods are close cousins. This one lives in the bottom of the ocean. Roly polies live in your garden. So, an isopod is spelled this way. As long as you don't drop your whiteboard, you can spell it. <gasps> isopod. Now, in science, P-O-D refers to feet. Remember, they have lots and lots of little feet. What else do you notice about this animal? Is there anything that looks familiar? Hmm. Well, I have a little isopod over at my camera off screen that we're gonna take a look at. I have a lot of artifacts I gotta move out of the way so we can look at our deep sea isopod. Okay. Turn the lights down a little bit. That look a little bit more roly-poly-ish? Still like a giant roly-poly, isn't it? And we can see it has all the little legs in here. It's kind of long for a roly-poly, but if you ever get a chance to look at roly-polies, they have all these segments on their shells. Now, because these are deep ocean dwelling animals, they need a tail to help them swim. You can't quite see it because it's in the box here, but their tail is actually a lot more like a lobster tail. It has these extra parts they can fan out and help them swim. It's kind of fun watching them swim because have you ever seen a dog swim do the dog paddle? They have a lot of little legs underneath that do a lot of dog paddling and their tail can help kick to make them move really quickly. So the, this is a little deep sea isopod. That picture we showed you is the giant deep sea isopod. Now when I say giant, I mean giant roly-poly animal. It's about 10 to 12 inches long. We had a couple here for a while, and I really love getting to watch them. You didn't always get to watch them swim. The big ones, you didn't really watch swim very often. Those little ones like that we have on the camera, we had a few of those too, and every once in a while you get to watch them swim around. How do they explore their environment? Well, how do we explore our environment? Hmm. We use our senses, right? Our five basic senses. Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. Yeah? Well, they do a lot of that too, but their antenna right here help do most of that job. Now, in, if you were an octopus or a sea star, you could taste or smell with your tentacles and arms. I don't think they do that with their toes, their tentacles help out with a lot of sensing the world around them. Now, it's pretty dark in the deep ocean, so a lot of animals either have really big eyes to help let in a lot of light, or they actually don't have any eyes because they don't really need them. Now, the isopod does have all the senses that we have. It could feel things moving around. It could smell. It's got to be able to taste its food because they do have a preference of food. We talked about what the bobtail squid eats, but what would a deep sea isopod eat? I don't see any big claws on it like those crabs did. Hmm, it's an interesting idea. A lot of animals are scavengers. So we talked about carnivores and herbivores, but what is a scavenging animal? 
they pick up all the leftovers. So a lot of scavengers will feed on things that have already passed away, but they also might just pick up extra bits from things that other things that are eating in the area. And even some of the scavengers will dig through the sand to get to their food. So they don't have big claws to tear things open. They don't have a big beak mouth like a bobtail squid to chew through the shells of other things. So they probably are going to have to eat stuff that's already in the sand. I don't think they're going to be able to swim up to an animal and catch them. How fast do the dogs swim with a doggy paddle? Sometimes they can get going pretty good, but it's not super fast, is it? More of their speed is going to be when they kick this big tail behind them in order to get away from a predator. But otherwise, their swimming is going to be real light and real slow. So they aren't going to chase their food in the middle of the water. They have to find food as they wander around, as they explore their environment. All right. Now, a good question about why do these things live at the bottom of the ocean came in. If it's such a difficult place to be in, why would they live down there? Hmm. Well, a lot of things have special adaptations to live in special areas. Some things have to live in trees. The roly polies, they actually don't live everywhere on land. They need a lot of water in the soil that they're in. If it's too dry, they aren't going to survive. So that's why I said they live in the garden, because sometimes our natural soil in the area is too dry. But when we have gardens or flower beds, we add extra water to that system, they might survive a little bit easier. Well, deep sea animals have adapted to live without light and able to find food that is not always available. So when they're scavenging or when they're looking for food in the deep sea, there's a lot of stuff that's living down there, but it's not quite as dense as like a coral reef or like a forest where there's you look around and there's tons of living things. There's a lot of things there, but it's not quite the same kind of habitat. They also have to survive a lot of water pressure. So sometimes these animals have adapted so well to living in the bottom of the ocean, they can't survive at the surface. Now the isopods can, because we had them here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. So they can survive at surface pressures. But a lot of animals, when you bring them up from the deep sea, they can't survive under the lack of pressure anymore. Or sometimes it's the temperature. The deep ocean is very, very cold. Now, why things start living in the bottom of the ocean is an interesting question. Perhaps way back in Earth's history, that was actually the best place to be. But then as the Earth changed and as continents moved and continents grew, maybe things became more favorable to go up higher or closer to other areas like coral reefs. I wasn't around back then, so we have to kind of guess as to what we find in the fossil record, leftovers of these animals that are preserved in the rock layers. So good question. I don't know entirely why they all live down there, but they can survive. And they have the abilities to survive in places we find really, really difficult. All right, let's switch over to an animal that lives mostly at the surface. We're going to talk about an animal with a big fancy mustache, kind of like me, but has bigger teeth than I do. We are going to talk about an animal that starts with the letter W. Do you know an animal with the letter W in its name that has a big furry mustache? That's a really good guess. So let's write it out. We have the letter W. This animal has tusks. Likes to dive in the ocean. Have you guessed it yet? Yep, you guessed it. It's the walrus. Look at that happy face. I don't know how they smile, but walruses are pretty cool animals. These tusks are really important for them. Now, I have an actual walrus tusk we can show you. And it's actually kind of heavy. Now this one, I don't even remember uh, where exactly this one came from, but we have a lot of artifacts that have been either donated to us or they're on loan to us that we can use to talk to our friends about the animals. This tusk is kind of like a large tooth. 
what would they need these tusks to do? Do you think they're stabbing their food with it? I don't know about you, but I don't like it when things are stuck between my teeth. That might be pretty tough to eat if it was stuck on your tusks. Hmm. What else could they use their tusks for besides chewing on things? Hmm. Finding food is a possibility. They'll use these big whiskery faces to look for their food and they'll actually eat crustaceans and clams and things out of the sand. So they'll search for their food at the sea floor, dig it up, and these tusks can help with that. They also can use it to dig into the ice. So their tusks are a great adaptation for their environment. But let's talk about how they move and survive in their environment. Do you think that walrus is going to win very many foot races? No, maybe that's why they're not smiling so much, because they know they can't run very fast. But they can swim very, very well. While their bodies might be kind of clumsy on land, they're actually really, really great at swimming. They're related to the seals and the sea lions. There's only one modern species of walrus, but there used to be more. For natural reasons, the other walrus species have gone extinct. But we still have this one species that survives, and we can use the examples of the seals and sea lions to talk about the walrus too. So when we think about how they swim, how do you think a walrus swims? Let's go back to the picture of just the one walrus real quick. It's easy to see their feet. Well, interesting. Now we said that they can find their food on the sea floor, so they probably don't have to swim too fast to catch it. But how do you think they're going to swim? Well, let's think of their cousins, the seals and the sea lions. Sea lions swim by using their pectoral flippers. It looks like they're flying underwater like this. They're very graceful. Now, even some of the biggest sea lions, which can be over a thousand pounds, are very graceful in the water. That walrus is many more than a thousand pounds. It's probably three to four thousand pounds. But they are still very graceful in the water. But their the sea lions and walruses' cousins, the seals, they swim a little bit differently. They don't have the big front flippers. They have little tiny front flippers. Seals use these to steer with, and they push with the back feet. Well, based off of what we can see, I would probably guess that because these feet back here are pretty big, they might do some combinations of work because their front flippers are not quite as long as the sea lions are. Now, I've never seen a walrus swim, but I'm going to guess they use a little bit more pushing power from the back. Now, Gianna's asking, what do they eat? It's always a good question to wonder about what things eat, because if they can't find their food, it's hard to survive in that habitat. So remember, they can eat things out of the sea floor, like clams and other crustaceans, like crabs and things like that. So they'll eat the mollusks like clams and the crustaceans like little crabs and things out of the sea floor. Because they have these big tusks, it's not as easy to catch a fish while they're swimming around. Their cousins, the seals and the sea lions have a very different diet too. Seals are probably going to eat more off the sea floor than out of the middle of the water. Like a sea lion will eat a lot of things out of the water like sharks and fish, octopus sometimes off the ground. So sea lions and seals can have a pretty variable diet, which is actually a really successful adaptation. If you can only eat one thing at all, the whole time, I hope that one thing sticks around because otherwise you wouldn't have anything to eat. So the pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, and walruses, by having a variable diet, meaning they can eat a lot of different things, they actually have a better chance of surviving if there's an imbalance in the system, or if there's not enough of one thing in the area, they can find something else to eat. So good question, Gianna. All right. The walrus. Majestic animal of the ocean. Have you ever seen a walrus? I've never seen a walrus in person. I've only been able to see them at zoos and aquariums and around the world because their habitat is not like down here in Southern California. They have a very special habitat. All right. Well, we have a few minutes left. We should do another animal name, shouldn't we? 
I have some really fun artifacts to show you. This animal covers a lot of different kinds. So this is more like a group of animals because there's so many types of these. It starts with a letter S. Makes this sound like a leaky balloon. So you might be thinking sharks because we started with shark lagoon. But I'll give you a hint, it's not sharks. S N Snickers? I do like candy bars. However, we don't have any of them on exhibit. I actually started writing Snickers instead of snail. I got candy on the brain still, even though it's not Halloween anymore. We're talking about snails. Now, snails come in lots of different kinds and sizes. This is a whelk. Now, whelks are carnivores. Do we remember what carnivore means? Yes, they eat meat. Good job. So this snail actually eats other snails. Maybe some clams and other things, but this snail doesn't get very big. Their shells only get about that big. I have a couple examples of snails that get real big. And these are not even the biggest snail shells of this kind that we have here in the studio. Let's put them under the camera real quick. Give you a little bit closer look of what's going on. I gotta move my tusk and my isopod out of the way. All right. Here's a snail shell and another snail shell. Now, if I did my research right, these are called helmet snails because their body is kind of the shape of like a helmet, you might say. Their shell is really interesting. I'm going to use a smaller one because it's a little easier to see on the camera. Inside this crevice would be where the body is. Now, snails grow their body and their shell like we grow. They eat nutrients and they can grow bigger. This shell is part of them, just like my fingernails are part of me. And only when the snail passes away is the shell left behind. Now, lots of animals use shells as a new home. Think of hermit crabs. Hermit crabs will pick up shells and use them as a temporary home. But they can't do that while the snail's inside because there's no room. Snails do not like roommates inside their shell. So that is what one kind of snail would look like. We saw the picture of that whelk, some snail shells have really, really pretty coloring inside, which is why people, after they use or eat the snails, might save them to use for things like jewelry or decoration, or actually you can just display the shell on its own. I have another really fun one. Still really big shell like this. It has these really almost like finger-like projections coming off the sides. This one's a really long shell, but it's not quite as tall as the others, and it doesn't have any super pretty colors inside. It's just white. Turn the lights down so we can see that a little bit better. There we go. So instead of having really pretty coloring inside, it's just this light coloring. But here is the crevice where the body of the snail would be. And they can pull inside this crevice and hide if they need to. Now, some snails can get even bigger. There's a really big shell we have in a different office here it's about this big and it's from a horse conch which is also a carnivorous snail it looks a lot more like that whelk shell that we were looking at earlier so snails can be really big but when they're babies they are microscopic it almost looks like a butterfly wearing the snail of a shell that's really cool so if you want to look up some extra information of stuff we were learning about today remember to check out the Nautilus, the Okeanos, and look more at the deep ocean. You can look up things about the walrus and see more about where they live and how they move and hunt. But you should also look at pictures of plankton snails because they're pretty cute. They're actually see-through too. So the pictures aren't going to look really pretty colored like this one. It's going to be a little bit different, but those baby snails are going to look really cute when you look them up. Well, that's all our time for today. Thanks for joining us for our ABCs Under the Sea and spelling and learning a little bit about some of our 
Ocean Friends today, we're going to be doing the invertebrate class next time. So at 10 o'clock, 30 minutes from now, learn about all kinds of invertebrates. Thanks for joining us on our Aquarium Online Academy.